Our gospel reading is from the first chapter of John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify to the light so that all who believe, all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood, or of the will of the flesh, or of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh, and lived among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. This is the word of the Lord. I, I'm sure I'm going to get in trouble with parents of young children for saying this, especially because my kids are grown now, but I just feel like something's right about going to church on Christmas Day. I mean, you know, the angels singing good news of great joy that shall be to all people and the shepherds cooing over baby Jesus and then returning to their fields amazed and glorifying God for all they had seen and heard, the gentle Jesus meek and mild, uh, there wrapped in swaddling clothes, the star in the sky looking down where he lay in the hay, right? My goodness, how much goodness can we cram into this story? Plus, we get to sing, Yea, Lord, we greet thee, born this happy morning. And we don't have to pretend it's Christmas morning when it's not. <laughs> we need Christmas Day worship, I think, to top off Christmas Eve worship, if we're ever to do justice to this whole thing. So thanks for coming. <laughs> but having said all that, did you notice that our gospel text today doesn't have a nativity story? I mean, no angels or shepherds or stars or songs. Luke gives us most of that. Matthew adds a little, omits most of the rest of it. Mark gives us nothing at all. Making it seem as if Jesus just appeared, fully grown, like Clint Eastwood in a spaghetti western, <laughs> riding in on a horse from the desert to save the day or the world, right? John's Christmas story is really a creation story. Did you hear it? He's the last to write a gospel. He would have known Matthew, Mark, and Luke their version of things, he wants us to think of this from a different angle. John begins at the beginning, the beginning of all things. He doesn't want us to think of Jesus appearing in the middle of history as an afterthought or a plan B. Jesus is not the divine Son of God only because he was conceived of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He is who he is because he always has been who he is. That is, the child who was born in Bethlehem is the word of God through whom all the worlds were made. He is not the exception to the rule of how babies are born. He is the mold and the model 
of what God had in mind from the start of creation and what God has in mind for the start of the new creation. In him was life, and the life was the light of all people. Life and light. These two things that are all things. Light and life to all he brings, we sing. This all is a crucial theme of Christmas. Now, Luke gets at the all by naming all sorts of people who are part of his Christmas pageant in his gospel. So he has, right, the angels, and he has the shepherds, he has Mary and Joseph, and, and, and Matthew has wise men. John steps all the way back to the first moment of creation, all the way back and says that the meaning of this person can be found in all things. No one and nothing that was made came into being apart from the word of God that finally on that bleak midwinter night in Bethlehem came to be flesh in Jesus. So John's telling of creation through the word recalls the Genesis account of creation. In the beginning, in Genesis, God speaks the word and says, let there be light, and there was light. And then the rest of creation is made over six days that culminates in the coming to be of human life. John reverses the order a bit by saying that life came into being through him, and this life was the light of all people. So life and light, or light and life, whatever the order, are related. Let's take John's order and look deeper. John is making claims that this, in this first chapter that are nothing short of a grand unified theory of everything. Jesus is the eternal word of God that becomes flesh. In him is life, life itself. These are universal claims. Our Christian faith is connected to the fabric of all reality. Now what that means is that if you want to find out something about Christ, you can look anywhere. Anywhere. Now, the Bible is not to be overlooked in your looking. The Bible is God's revelation to us about God's revelation to us. You should write that one down for a tweet, Mark. That's a, that's a good line, don't you think? Do you think that's a good line? I think that's a good line. The Bible is God's revelation to us about God's revelation to us. <laughs> it's the word about the word. That one's pretty good too. <laughs> Spell the first word with a lower case and the second word with the upper case. No. Okay. The Bible doesn't point to itself as we so often think it does, as if it is the Word incarnate. It points to the Word who became flesh in Jesus, but it also, throughout, as in the case with John here, and Paul in Colossians, and John, another John in Revelation, and David in the Psalms, and Solomon in the Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, for example. Oh, and the writer of Hebrews, too, we heard earlier, points us to look everywhere else for him, too. What John wants us to see is that there are not two realms of reality to explore. One, a natural world, which is accessible to us through science, that we can understand by methods of human inquiry, and two, a supernatural world that we 
can only access by faith because it is always and only above us and beyond us, outside of our experience. No. Christmas tells us that God is for us by being with us. And more than that, that God always has been with and for us. Jesus only makes clear what has been true since the beginning of time and will be till the end. God is a part of creation, not apart from it. The eternal God is deeply invested in time. Now, this universal claim also means that Christianity cannot ever be a tribal religion. Whenever we try to turn Christianity into a Western religion or a white religion, we blaspheme the Christ of Christianity. Christianity may have appeared historically in the first century of the Common Era, but it is rooted in the truth of all time and all being. If the Word became flesh in Jesus, then Jesus belongs to all humans, not just to Christians. Underneath all religious longing and human aspiration for God is the Word who prompts it. Now, I'm sometimes misunderstood when I say things like, God is in the sorting business, not me, you know? Sometimes I like to say, I'm in sales, not management. What I mean by that is that we are not more committed to Christ by using him to commit people to hell. As if that's telling people the whole truth, even if it's politically incorrect. I would rather be theologically correct and say that Christ has a purchase on all things and all people because in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. Now, that isn't a slight to other religions either. Making a grand claim like this about our faith isn't making a grand slam about anybody else's faith. Every religion makes universal claims to truth. Sometimes those claims compete with one another. Often they are addressing different questions. If Christmas teaches us the truth that Christ himself is life, then we should be able to look for him in the truth of other faiths too. After all, we sing joy to the world, not joy to Christians only, right? In him was life, and the life was the light of all people. If you haven't noticed, Christmas lights are everywhere. We light our Christmas trees, our houses, and our yards, not me. Don't do that. We light candles, Christmas and light go together. Because Jesus says about himself, I am the light of the world. Now, in Matthew, he tells his disciples, his followers, us, uh, you are the light of the world. And that's another take, and we'll actually get to that in Epiphany as things unfold. But in John, Jesus says that he himself is the light of the world. And then John says about him that he is the true light which enlightens every person. The first meaning of this could be tied to the sense that human beings have sense. We are sentient beings. That is... We think. We not only live like plants and animals, we know we do. We're able to be aware, 
to think about the fact that we live. Light is tied to knowledge in the Bible. To be enlightened is to know something or perceive something about the truth. In the long course of continuing creation, symbolized by six days in Genesis, you will note that animals and humans are created on the same day, day six. That is to say, we are closer to one another than to the rest of creation. Higher life forms. What we mean by higher for humans has to do with this leap into consciousness that has taken place, that makes us human beings, made in the image and likeness of God. To say that Jesus then is the light of the world is to say that he is the source of all knowing. He enlightens us. He makes us aware of who we are and who God is and how to live in the world. Hail the son of righteousness, Charles Wesley said in his great hymn. That's son, S-U-N. So it wouldn't be wrong, don't you know, if you spelled it S-O-N, to hail the Son of Righteousness, light and life to all he brings. C.S. Lewis said something profound about this. I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen, not only because I see it, but because by it I see everything else. Nice. As the light of the world, Jesus is the constant of the universe that allows us to see and measure and weigh everything else. But light also has a moral quality about it. It distinguishes truth from error, beauty from ugliness, goodness from evil. Sadly, this is something too many of us fear, preferring darkness to the light. But that's because we fail to understand the nature of God as pure, unconditional love. When Tom was a teenager, he and some friends were walking around the neighborhood. It was a warm night and dark, suddenly one of them saw a police car and shouted. Well, they hadn't done anything wrong, but they didn't want to be seen either, and so they started running, scurrying. They turned down an alley, and the police car was chasing them then, thinking, I guess, that they were up to something wrong. They saw the police car, and they just kept Running in the alley, Tom tripped over some garbage cans, making a racket, and one of the police officers got out of the car and began to run after him. Well, suddenly, one of the officers turned on a searchlight. Tom looked around for his friends, didn't see them. All he saw was that burning, searching light looking for him. So Tom jumped behind the trash cans, and he found his friends huddled there. (laughs) They frantically all tried to hide. In fact, they even started putting garbage on themselves to camouflage and blend in, right? And then the spotlight fell on Tom. Come out where we can see you, said the voice behind the light. Tom stood up, covered in garbage, What are you doing, said the voice. Nothing. I can't hear you. What are you doing? Officer, I wasn't doing anything wrong. I saw the light. I ran. I knocked over these garbage cans. I'm sorry for the disturbance. The searchlight was beaming in his eyes, burning them. He stood there in the light with nowhere to hide, and then the voice said, I think I recognize you. Don't you live around the corner? 
Yes. His heart was racing. He thought to himself, my life is ruined. If I don't get arrested, something worse will happen. He'll tell my parents. But then the voice behind the light said something unexpected. Son, I'm not here to punish you. I'm here to protect you. As he stood before that searchlight, Tom says he caught a glimpse of what it might like, be like to stand before Jesus, who is the light of the world. There he was, fully exposed, yet completely protected. He was fully revealed, yet free from unnecessary punishment. He stood hip deep in garbage, yet cleaner than he had ever felt, somehow cleansed by a light that casts no shadow. Light and life to all he brings. There it is. Merry Christmas, friends.